Welcome to the Great Beer State podcast from the Michigan Brewers Guild. The Great Beer State is a weekly show sharing conversations and stories from the passionate people who contribute to our vibrant Michigan beer community. It is made up of a mix between full-length archived interviews from the Guild's first documentary book project, A Rising Tide, Stories from the Michigan Brewers Guild, and conversations recorded in the here and now. Each episode is kicked off with a conversational update from host Scott Graham, Executive Director of the Guild, and the Brevangelist Fred Biltman, author of A Rising Tide. Here's Scott and Fred. Welcome to episode 14 of Michigan's Great Beer State podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Scott Graham, Executive Director of the Michigan Brewers Guild. Scott, how are things? Things are well, Fred. Welcome to episode 14. Uh, They're clicking right along. Um, I think it's great that we've got enough to kind of binge listen to if somebody's ready to do that. They are uh, all really great interviews. I know I enjoy, have enjoyed them, even the ones that I listened to for the second time. So yes, it's good to be back for episode 14. Yeah, and this is a special one. We're going to be talking to Ted Badgero, who has a very unique position, unique history within our Michigan brewing history as really the first uh, commercial brewing license since 1947, I think we figured out. So we'll talk more about him uh, as an introduction to the episode and the interview. Um, But as usual, we like to start with updates for the brewery, allied and enthusiast members or our beer loving public. So uh, what's new these days? Well, we're still in the midst of, uh, of pandemic times. I know that just uh, recently Michigan State announced that they wouldn't be having students back on campus for the most part. I think I think I read that they were allowing it in a limited fashion for foreign students or something, but they don't want kids back in the dorms. And um, uh, my guess is that we'll see some other universities going along the same route as well. Sounds pretty frustrating if you're a parent of a college student. Yeah, I think it's also interesting. Um, well, I imagine you, you'll weigh in more on this, but it's interesting to think about where we take our cues from as well in terms of, you know, everybody's making decisions in a sort of unprecedented situation. Every week that goes on continues this. Well, we haven't bit quite been here before. So I think it's interesting to look at other organizations, other industries, and um, I think that'll be a continued pattern for us to figure out how to work within our own industry and, and try to do a little future telling, uh, fortune telling to figure out when things may change and how. Yeah, there are really are a lot of unknowns. That's something that gets brought up a lot. And we recently announced that we wouldn't be having the the last festival in our calendar year this year, the Detroit Fall Beer Festival, which was scheduled for October. Um, so more sad news, um, but not surprising. And as you know, our uh, our our group that works on planning our annual conference and trade show has been working on putting together um, an itinerary since we start in. March, April, May timeframe, and um, and we're looking ahead of January and being uncertain about what we can do and trying to decide um, if we build a virtual event, what does it what does it look like, and is that interesting to uh, to our brewery members and our allied members and others who attend the conference. So it's uh, um, I'll, I'll say the conversations are thought provoking and they're they're evoking creativity but um (laughs) they're not really the funnest thing to think about (laughs) yeah and it's it's sure it's difficult to plan an event no matter what and when you don't know what your environment is going to look like what's going to be allowed what's not going to be allowed what will help people feel safe what where we will be with these things, not knowing the context is almost like the, 
you know, the, the thing that upsets planning the most is like, well, who knows? Uh, I think it got brought up in our a recent meeting. It's like, um, there's another national organization that are essentially planning one event in three ways. They're planning three events and they'll do one of them uh, as a way to kind of be ready for anything. And that's, that's a lot. So, um, you know, I think one thing would be great if, uh, brewery members that love the conference and love attending. If you've got thoughts or ideas or something that you think would be valuable, um, we'd love to hear input. Uh, this is a really good time to weigh in and talk about what your thoughts are and what you'd find valuable and um, an experience during sure. conference time. I don't know if you have any other specific Happy to hear uh, any, any thoughts. Yeah, no, I just uh, agree. I think uh, we're going to do some outreach and try and get a sense of, of what people think. Um, everybody's a little bit over, over Zoomed or over teleconferenced, but we're all adapting to, to that environment and are getting some useful information and connection out of it as well. So it's, uh, it works both ways. Yeah, and it's interesting coming off the last couple of weeks of interviews too, where both Peter and Aubrey weighed in as to how much they took away from the conferences and how much that was sort of a treasured part of their guild experience. So we know uh, that a lot of us uh, really enjoy that networking and that connection. And if, if it doesn't happen in person, it's going to look different. So uh, it'd be great to draw on everybody's uh, collective input about what would be valuable, most valuable with your time uh, if that has to change format. So um, other than that, anything new for members other than our continued uh, be nice to your breweries campaign, uh, especially if you're visiting them in person and continue to support them. Anything else? No, I I think that's an important thing to note, even though we've mentioned it many times now. Um, it's still really frustrating. I'm still hearing reports of uh, people having a hard time with, you know, upset and angry customers. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really hard. I think people at brewery tasting rooms sincerely want to offer a, a, a nice experience and, and also follow the rules and safety guidelines and it's a difficult balance when when somebody just doesn't want to um, follow the rules and then it makes everybody comfortable and it can be even worse than that so you're right everybody needs to be a little patience and thoughtful um, it, it can be difficult at times but um, a little patience goes a long way please be thoughtful yep absolutely um, so that said, why don't we, uh, jump right in to the Brewer's Dozen, our weekly tradition here of giving a shout out to 13 member breweries, uh, that make up, uh, the portion of our, of our Michigan Brewers Guild member role, uh, and takes us around the state. Scott, you want to start? Yeah, let's, uh, start our tour in Holland at Big Lake Brewing. Um, fun local brewery that opened and then grew and expanded out of their original location is in their second location and canning and distributing some product. So Big Lake Brewing, Highland, Michigan. Yeah, next up is Blake's Brewing Company in Armada, Michigan. Yeah, Blake's is primarily known for their cider. They make quite a bit of cider, but they've got a, a bona fide brewing operation and, and make some good beers in addition to their other farm operations. So that's a fun place to visit. And um, another kind of farm themed brewery is Brewery Terra Firma in Traverse City. They have some on-site farm aspects and really try and utilize local ingredients or in some that they grow themselves so um i really enjoy it i guess i'm due for a visit back to terra firma yeah next up is brick house brews in sparta michigan i suppose that's where you go to let it all hang out there's my musical joke for the afternoon <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> I get it. Uh, Brickhouse uh, was formerly Cellar Brewing, and they've uh, reopened as Brickhouse Brews and um, have uh, really some great taste in beers and tasty food as well. Uh, also in that southwest Michigan area is Kitzingen Brewery in Wyoming, which uh, again is is in the greater Grand Rapids area. And it's, uh, they're uh, German themed there. Um, nice little brewery. Yeah, and Lily's Brewery and Seafood Grill in Royal Oak. A lot of Michigan brewing history inside inside that brewery. Uh, as uh, Bob was uh, working with is. breweries, a long time member. Yep. Yep. You go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah, Bob Morton has been involved with with many breweries. Sorry to jump all over you, but um, shout out to um, Bob and and the team, the Morton team there at Lily's. Uh, Absolutely. Sticking with the, I guess the or going back to Southwest Michigan, we've got Founders Brewing Company. Of course, I think most people know that Founders is in Grand Rapids and they also have um, a brewery and tasting room in Detroit as well. And next up is Grand Armory Brewing Company in Grand Haven. Nice spot to have a beer, good music program. Yeah, Grand Armory's, yeah great beers and they've got their their cool pub downtown and they're distributing beers out into the marketplace and doing finding some success with that uh old mill brew pub and grill in plainwell i guess it's uh i guess a, a quaint small town brewery but another fun place to visit to be sure absolutely and then heading way up North, we've got Red Jacket Brewing Company in Calumet. Yeah, Red Jacket Brewing Company is inside the Michigan House Cafe, which is a, uh, an historic building in a an historic town, uh, all the way up in the, not all the way up to the end, but up in the Keweenaw Peninsula. And uh, another historic building, or I, I believe it's a, a church, that Salt Springs Brewery in Saline is in and that's in the Ann Arbor area but Salt Springs is a, a beautiful place and a, a, a really cool building. And we've got uh, Speciation Artisan Ales in Comstock Park and they just made a shift in that they've got a brand new tasting room uh, just opened pretty recently and um, there's a lot of buzz about that so certainly check them out. Yeah uh, they're Definitely a, a unique brewery in the state. Um, and last but not least on our list today is Trail Point Brewing Company in Allendale. So Allendale is a little west of Grand Rapids, um, but it's a it's a great place to stop if you're in between the Lake Shore and Grand Rapids, or if you're just um, thirsty and looking for a place to wet your whistle. I would suggest it. All right. Well, that wraps up the Brewer's Dozen for this week. It, um, you know, even being involved with this and, and going through this every week, it still continues to amaze me how far and wide our brewery members cover. And so the reality is you're never far from a Michigan brewery. So um, whether you head to one that you know really well or adventure into a new one you haven't met yet, we hope you'll all give them a visit and, um, and check out their beers. It's uh, it's pretty awesome to see. So with that, we'll head into uh, introducing Ted Badgero. Uh, this is one of those interviews. When I listen to it, I'm reminded of of so much of our conversations of why we put this project together in the first place. And I'm reminded of of this idea that all of us can uh, can learn from hearing other stories and other perspectives and so having come about the scene in the mid nineties, you know, and thinking back to that being my origin story and what I might be able to share forward to somebody else who came later. Here's Ted who's home brewing in 1978 and applying for a brewer's license when nobody had for, uh, what did he say? 35 years or something. So, um, 
I just find the, the story yeah. fascinating and yeah. uh, the lessons to be valuable. And Ted is a, a unique character for sure. Yeah, and this is really is a, a historic interview um, and, and it's mentioned, but you know, it's historic, not just for Michigan, but for the whole Midwest. Um, when Ted got started in 1982, there wasn't anybody else doing what he was doing. Um, and, and of course, we're talking about the Real Ale Company in Chelsea, Michigan, um, but he was truly a pioneer um, and the brewery didn't last uh, until, you know, not very long really at all, but um, he was paving new ground, had nowhere to turn other than his own uh, creativity and ingenuity, really, he and his partner to, to make the brewery try and go. And it, it's fun that we still have Ted around and as part of the community today to share his firsthand hand experience with, um, I don't know, what might have been the first microbrewery east of the Mississippi. Uh, don't, don't quote me on that as fact, but he was, Ted was very early on. Yeah. And so I think when, you know, various conversations you and I have had, we've, we've had the thought of like, we've got to get some of these stories while they're still here. And uh, this is one of those stories that I'm so grateful to have heard and um, have brought to other people. So I'm really appreciative of Ted's willingness to share. And I'm so uh, excited and, and sort of thrilled that he's back in the game, that uh, he could come back and enjoy um, and participate and engage in this industry that uh, at, on round one, he was just way ahead of his time. And so it's great to see him uh, back brewing um, and in the industry with Ipsy Ale House. So Scott, when he was coming back around, yeah, and uh, uh, I was just going to ask you if you had conversations with him as they were getting open and if you were aware that uh, he was approaching coming back in. Um, I didn't know until they were, they, they weren't, I don't think they were quite open yet, but they were just about open or maybe they had just opened um, when I found out about it. I think I was probably talking to Mike O'Brien, um, but I, I don't remember exactly other than, I, I remember having some excitement over the fact that, uh, that Ted was around and I was going to get a chance to talk to him um, some and get to know him a little bit, uh, which I have, and he is a very interesting character. Um, so no, I, I, I didn't have a big heads up, but uh, had some enthusiasm when I heard about it. Yeah, so I think this should be required listening for every member brewery out there, really, uh, in, in my humble opinion. And uh, like I said, I'm excited and, and grateful for Ted for sharing these stories. Um, unless you got anything else to add, I'm happy to kick it off to this interview from the Rising Tide Archives where we sat with Ted Badgero uh, in Motor City Beer Works uh, in the fall of 2018 and, and heard about Real Ale Company and Ipsy Ale House. Here's Ted. Yeah, let's get to Ted. Let's drink Michigan beer from coast to coast, from far and near. It's local and delicious, any styles that you wishes. So raise your glass and toast your friend. Let's drink Michigan beer. Cheers. Cheers. Best rendition ever. So how in the world did you find yourself in beer? Um, this is your second second uh, uh foray uh, foray into <laughs> beer tell me how uh, uh you you started in the first place uh i was riding my bicycle across michigan from muskegon down to ann arbor which i would do yearly my wife's family lived in muskegon and uh, so i uh i uh, stay over in lansing overnight with some friends uh, but i was pedaling into grand rapids at about uh, about noon a little afternoon uh, to my best friend Jim Rouse's house, my musical buddy and, you know, best man at my wedding and all. Uh, and he said, hey, you look hot, you want a beer? And I said, sure. Uh, hey, it's, it's noon uh, and I'm hot. So uh, we, uh, he poured me a really nice dark beer and I said, hey, Jim, you're, uh, 
you must have gotten a raise. You're buying the imports now. And he said, no, I brewed it myself. I said, no. He said, yeah. I said, gee, uh, this is pretty good. Um, how much does it cost you a bottle to brew this stuff? He said, oh, less than 20 cents. I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes yeah. good, 20 yeah. cents, I'm in. Yeah. What year was that? 1978. That was the year that, thank you, President Carter, for signing that bill, yeah. that uh, home brewing was legalized, I yeah. believe. Was it 77 or 78? Uh, yeah, I, don't, I, think it's, I think it was 78, but yeah. I wouldn't. Uh, but he had bought enough. a couple of... Uh, uh, so it and, sounds like your buddy Jim might have been brewing prior to legality. No, no. no he hey, started just, when it was legal? Yeah. And uh, what he did on? was to, uh, of course, we had cans of Edme or Mutton and Fice and malt syrup. Yeah. And the instructions say, well, one can of syrup and uh, one, you know, and I don't know, three or four cups of corn sugar. Yeah. But he had come upon the idea of, why don't I just use two cans of syrup, uh, malt syrup, yeah. extract and um that made all the difference interesting uh in that in fact even michael bryan when he uh you know michael bryan yeah. i'm sure uh came out to our brewery in chelsea uh, i um i was given a tour to him and um and convinced him to stop adding corn sugar to his beer and just do 100 percent malt and he credits me with having him brew his first really good beer wow uh, That's awesome. That. And, so, uh, so fill in some blanks from uh, from that fateful bike ride and, and uh, cold beer on a hot day to having a brewery in Chelsea. Well, what, what did that look like? Uh, I had been married in 1975, and uh, at that time I worked on a dairy farm. And my partner and I, uh, Gordon Averill, uh, well, not partner, he was the farmer and I was the, you know, uh, yeah. I'd get out there and slop in the morning and, yeah. uh, uh, but uh, uh, so I'd stop by his place every once in a while and I brought him some of my home brewed beer and he said hey uh, you know why don't we just brew some out here at the farm for home consumption uh, and because you can brew a hundred at I believe it's still a hundred gallons per capita per person per year for home brewing and the maximum of 200 so we figured well we're pretty close to within the limits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, we bought a lot of malt syrup and started um, uh, brewing from extracts out there on the farm. And um, that was the time when uh, it was the Say Yes to Michigan campaign. Uh, like nowadays, a lot of dairy farms were going out of business. And Gordy, fifth generation dairy farmer, had to sell his farm. And uh, we, we were looking in the tank one day uh, with full of milk. We had just milked the cows and I, you know, titty dipped with iodine, all the cows and, and he's looking in there and kind of shaking his head and saying, you know, I'm going to be losing money on this, on this milk. There's, I'm just, how can I make a profit at the going price? And I said, well, gee, uh, what if it was filled with beer? <laughs> And so um, we said, hey, what? I mean, really, uh, dairy tanks, uh, stainless steel vessels with a compressor unit that can chill and covers made a really clean. Sanitized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, we used a couple for fermentation vessel uh, for mash tun and um, uh, and for primary ferment uh, and uh, it turned out really nicely, and I'd, I'd serve some and beer. what size tanks for those? Those are about 110 gallons. Yeah, so mm -hmm. your annual limits uh, well, up one, pretty quick. One tank. <laughs> well, actually, no, these were the ones we used in Chelsea for, oh, for the, uh, uh, and we got a, um, a, an old restaurant soup kettle that was, uh, I sold it to Larry Bell. It was his first brew kettle. Uh, I think it was 15 gallons, and yeah. we'd put the modified... I wrote a lot of copy with that story, so we yeah. always said it was 15 gallons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of, uh, we'd use the modified malts in there for... Well, we'd, we'd get um, out of Fink Brothers in Dundee, uh, Carl and Gary. I think they're still there uh, selling homebrew supplies. Uh, and so uh, we would uh, run on down there, and uh, we have started with, you know, just gallons of malt syrup, but we eventually 
uh, when we started the brewery, we got 55 gallon drums of uh, uh, Edme or Mutton and Faison or um, Mutt Melek, yeah. an Irish uh, stout, which is really nice. I mean, you can brew really good beer with extracts. Yeah, it doesn't pay nowadays. Uh, I mean, it, at the ale house, we uh, it's all uh, everything is mashed. I don't use any yeah. extract. So, what year did you open the brewery? It was 1981 when we incorporated. And we um, were licensed in uh, September of 1982. Uh, and so we were the first. So it was a year in planning, and the landscape mm -hmm. had to be Stroh, right. Frankenmuth, anybody else? Heilman used to have a factory, but they moved on out. We were the one of three breweries in Michigan. Yeah, and amongst mm -hmm. those models, you're, you're converting dairy tanks and and starting on a scale that is not even like perceptible to those other to those other oh, breweries, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so what was it like even applying for the license? Had anybody, I mean, did, did they even fathom what the hell you well, were talking about? That we got a nice letter, a letter from the federal government that uh, said uh, basically, um, starting a brewery uh, is uh, an enterprise that takes considerable capital and, you know, a kind of beware uh, letter because nobody had licensed a brewery in 37 years in the state of Michigan, Wow, a new brewery. And so, um, in fact, we so had... So that's the, that's the 40s. Uh, yeah. Right? It, well, the, the laws were from 1933, repeal right, of prohibition. I mean, 37 from 82 uh, uh, is 45, right? Yeah. So that's only... Twelve years after the repeal of prohibition was the last time they issued a license prior, prior to real yeah, uh, yeah. real company. So things were really locked in, and of course we have. I don't know, I'm I'm kind of a beer philosopher uh, when it comes to it, uh, and there was a. May I diverge for just Please. a moment? Okay, uh, there was a Mr. Moskowitz who I heard a summary of his TED talk. Uh, and he was employed by Prego to make spaghetti sauce, and he, his degree was in perfection of product recipes uh, to compete with ragu, which had most of the market. And so he started out by, well, they had questionnaires asking people what kind of spaghetti sauce they liked. Uh, and people would check up, oh, I like thick and chunky, I like, you know, this and that, or these herbs. And, and then he did taste testings in 10 different cities throughout the United States, and he found that the, um, what people, what they put down for a taste test, it's like BJCP. You know, you can describe what it, you think a beer should look, you know, taste like, yeah. oh, I want this, but until you taste them. And he found that the results from the tastings were completely different, radically different, from what they'd put down on paper. Because you have to go by taste. Yeah. And from 1933 on into our era, you know, in the 1980s, and up until the revolution really started in the 19, 1990 or so, um, the idea was that there is the perfect beer. I mean, you know, taste light, less filling, or whatever, yeah. and all the. But yeah. it was American light lager. And it was narrowing beer. it to a uh, example, an beer. example oh, of one, a beer. one category. Yeah. In well, fact, and uh, all beer. Well, let's say over ninety percent of the beer sold in the United States is light lager beer. Kind out of the wrong end of a horse in my book, but yeah. uh, we're trying to Im improve that uh, yeah. idea with this yeah. historic yeah. recipe. And, uh, right over there, and, and so what we so have many. now, uh, Mr. Moskowitz came up with the idea of a vertical spectrum. There is no greatest spaghetti sauce in the world. There are different types of spaghetti sauces that appeal to different people, and the same applies to beer. Yeah. So how old were you when 
um, you went on this adventure and, and yeah. wrote the federal government for a brewer's license. See, I was born in, in the state of uh, I was born in 1951, and that was 1982. So yeah, I was like 31 years old. And, and what had you been doing for a career up until that point? Um, I was a uh, uh, professional musician, and um, uh, I, later I became a ceramic tile installer. I'm always eyeballing floors and <laughs> things like, like this. Uh, but I was, uh, came from a culinary background. I started cooking in 1975 for a frat house at U of M, uh, Psi Upsilon on Hill Street. 45 right. hungry guys, lunch and dinner. And I could sling it. And, um, and later I cooked for a sorority. And I was uh, actually, when I was starting the brewery, I was the kitchen supervisor for the U Club kitchen in the Michigan Union. Wow. And um, subsequently, I was the head cook at a, a school and hospital. And before I started the Ipsy Ale House, I was working at Mott Children's Hospital as a cook, too. Good job. Uh, prepping like crazy, 6 to 11, four mornings a week, chop, chop, chop. And cooking and beer brewing are just the same thing. There's really very little difference between. Uh, it's, well, I like cooking better because I spend 90% of or 80% of my time actually working with the food. One of the things that people don't realize about professional brewing is that you spend 80% of your time CIPing tanks and hoses and moving things from place to place. It may sound glamorous, but it really ain't, Fred. It's, uh, uh, so, yeah, I, well, you I, know, I think I mean, there's a lot that uh, not everybody grasps. But I, I want to go back to um, 82, your opening prior to the law that allowed you to sell beer by the glass to a consumer. Yes, that was um, much later. So you're opening with the same license, the same rules, the same structure as as the other There's two the breweries. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, <coughs> as the first beers came out of the tank, um, <coughs> how did you package your beer? How did you sell oh. it to consumers? What was your introduction <coughs> to the market like? Um, excuse me. What we did was uh, we had a roller line that uh, went from the... <coughs> uh, it, we had a bottling line, and we would fill four bottles at a time with a little, well, at first we'd counter pressure, not, not pressure, we'd fill them up with CO2, and, uh, and then the beer would bring kind it on, gravity on up fill. to there. And then uh, went down to uh, basically a hand capper, Herschel Langston was our, our capper, and uh, Karen would put the labels on the beer, uh, which was actually the most time-consuming process in the beer production at that time. And we sold to, I don't know, over 30 outlets uh, by the case, uh, 24 bottles. Well, we, the Michigan uh, return law had been passed a couple of years before that. And all the, all the liquor stores or uh, beer stores were grumbling like crazy about, uh, you know, having to have all this extra space. So it turns out that the Guinness and Harp and Bass bottles, they hey, nobody's going to send them back to England. They went straight to the crusher. Yeah. So we uh, it partnered up with um, Arbor Beverage on Jackson Road, Teddy and his wonderful family and their dog, and uh, uh, bought the used bottles for two cents a bottle. And we had a large tank with uh, sanitizer, and we'd actually take a drill uh, with a you know, a cleaning mechanism on in there and visually inspect them and sanitize them and have them ready for brewing. So washing bottles was... Uh, uh, wow. That, and but soaking that, the labels off. And, yeah, I bet that and, took some time. And it was really uh, curious with the, oh, the licensing of the, the beer on our labels. Uh, well, the... Um, now, is that... was the, You also had to sell through a distribution network, so... Uh, no, uh, we could distribute ourselves. Oh, that's right. Ourselves. So self-distribution was At available that until time. that law in 93. Yes, and, okay. and yep. until it subdivided into microbreweries and group pubs. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we... Uh, so you uh, delivered to those 30 yeah. uh, accounts. Yeah, uh, Big Ten Party Store was one of our largest accounts. Yeah. Uh, I delivered to the sidetrack in uh, Ypsilanti uh, just at the time when, just before Linda... Was taking over oh, wow. there, and so uh, I mean, 
you Bells hasn't opened yet. Mm-hmm. Nobody had, nobody could have approached these bars and stores before with this sort of story. No, it was a whole new so idea. So, what were those first conversations like? You know, uh, my name's Ted, and I'm introducing well, you to an idea you've never thought of. Would you like to buy my beer? Well, Mr. Cook had actually started that process with his in New York of bringing samples around to yeah. potential outlets. Yeah. Uh, to uh, uh, and um, so that's what I did. Uh, and they're the same kind of regulations now uh, as then. You can give away uh, so many ounces of, yeah. of samples. Uh, and uh, so uh, we developed a, a, a list of places, and I was the, the, I call myself a beer chauffeur now, but I was the delivery boy <laughs> uh, for that. Yeah. It had to be a wild time. Um, it was, I guess, uh, to look back, it was the Stone Age of microbrewing. Yeah. I called people like uh, Boulder Brewery, uh, Otto Savatone was the brewer back then. That, that's been a while. Uh, we went, you know, and I did go to the beer festivals out in Colorado. Uh, Charlie Papazian, his uh, book, The Complete Joy of Home Brewing, was, uh, was useful, uh, and although it had just been, been published uh, yep. about that time. Uh, so, uh, when I compare the wealth of materials, I mean, I can get online and order, hey, I'll get with Brian Tennis up at MHA and uh, say, hey, I, you know, I need some Citra, I need some Osaka, I need some Mosaic for my Tridge, the New England IPA that we have. Uh, and uh, I can get almost any kind of yeast that I want, almost any type of malt that I want from several different sources. We go through basically BSG and get a, a pallet there uh, from them, you know, enough for about six batches. Yeah. We have a, a five barrel system. And so, uh, but back then it... Uh, yeah, when you went to go all grain, like how did, how did you get grain? How did you get... We never hops? went all grain at the, uh, at the uh, Chelsea uh, Ale House. Could, could or, you have? At the real ale company, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we did probably eighty percent extract, and uh, the other, the rest were. And in were that. you buying hops basically from yeah, a homebrew channel, or were you uh, able to? I bought get the hops bigger? from Dave Wills out at Fresh Hops in Oregon, and okay. we'd get whole fresh hops, which were wonderful. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, use muslin bags and, and toss those on in yeah. in the brew. Uh, for uh, we didn't have the big dry hopping, uh, and we didn't actually have a um, a carbonation a BT a bright tank, uh, uh, what I call government tanks now because yes. whatever goes out of those is what we pay tax on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so it was, um, yeah, it was whole new territory. There were no business models to follow because nobody else had yeah. had done this. So. Um, you know, spoiler alert, we know that that, that company didn't uh, uh -huh. uh, make it. What um, what happened uh, in terms of when did you decide to move on to something else? Uh, we sold all the beer that we could brew. And looking at the, at the yearly, you know, at the figures, we were selling for $20 a case, which at that time was more than, more than Guinness was 18 bucks a case. And we were uh, spending... Twenty-five dollars and fifty some cents per case to produce it. In our budget, uh, it was all sweat equity. Gordy, Stuff to make any up on volume if uh, you're losing five bucks. Yeah, a case. Uh, Gordy and I started the place uh, with a total of twelve thousand dollars. That's for all expenses all for rent for everything. You can't start a hot dog stand for that, uh, especially nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, I'm, I, I'm the first to admit, I was not a good businessman. And, and how many years did, uh, did you uh, sell beer? We went through into 1984, and then pay, couldn't pay the bills, and uh, I retired for, actually I retired from even home brewing because I figured, hey, I've been doing it 110 gallons at a time, I'm not going back to five, five gallon carboys. Uh, 
and we did start, uh, uh, a, a partner and I started a, a store on Ann Street in Ann Arbor called Fermentation, selling homebrew supplies. That was 1985, 86. And uh, so I think we were, uh, Big Ten had a few cans around here and there, but we were the first full supply store uh, for uh, brewing. And I actually, they had me into U of M to uh, teach some brewing classes for uh, young students, wow. which uh, was a, an elective course, no credit, uh, had to be 21, but uh, we got some students in there that, uh, gee, on the first try, they, they were brewing great beers. So yeah. that was kind of rewarding, at yeah. least in the progression of they didn't have to stumble through all the pitfalls we went through to discover how to. And it was about that it. time that uh, that Larry Bell opened the uh, Kalamazoo yeah. Brewing Company and Homebrew Supply Shop. I think Homebrew yeah. Supply was uh, probably during your time in 83. Right? Uh, actually, Larry bicycled out from Ann Arbor to our place huh. in, at the Real Ale Company. And we spent a morning and, um, yeah, had a, a couple of beers and he looked at everything. In fact, he, uh, when he left, he, he forgot his backpack, which was on top <laughs> of a cooler and had to come back for that. Uh, <laughs> that's hurts when you're on a bike. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, he, he kind of got, the, I mean, yeah, he, he came out and visited and got some ideas. And so, um, as somebody who'd kind of been on that front edge, I feel like there's, there's two tiers in my recollection as I started mm -hmm. with Larry in 95, um, but, but I became familiar with their history. And so, you have Bell's opening in 85, which, which made an impact and, and started to bring beer around the but state. He didn't make any money for the first four years. Yeah. He was like, very much like myself. His uh, wife worked as a nurse, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and my wife worked for U of M, and that's, <laughs> that's where the money that's how you <laughs> came from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, uh, so, to finance but things. I guess I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on watching the. The rest of the 80s play out, and then in 93, the law changes, and a, yeah. and a whole new model becomes available. And, yes. And as, as a Michigander and as a, as a brewer, um, how would you describe the next, the, 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 those, the change that happened in front of you? Uh, it's night and day. Yeah. Uh, just the, uh, in fact, uh, it's, back then, uh, you know, a, a, a small, a home brewer could, still even up through the 1990s and into early 20, 20s uh, do start a brewery uh, but now we've got I mean I have fermentation science uh, folks like Eastern Michigan University uh, uh, Corey and, and Greg over there and they've got programs at so many different places I think a lot of the difference is now you really you can't become, you can't start a brewery without having actual professional experience. I mean, you could, but might not be a good but idea. But you're going to be, you're going to be up against some challenges. Right. Yeah. And it's been baby steps for me these last three and a half years, uh, yeah. learning uh, on that transition to uh, uh, brewing on a professional larger scale. Not yeah. that we're a big brewery, but uh, uh uh, it's uh, to learn the equipment. I fortunately we have GW Kent right down the street, less than a mile away from the brewery. Yeah. And Michael Bryan, of course, uh, yeah. supplies. Uh, well, you know, he uh, helped to put together our brewery, as he has done for so many others throughout the state and, yeah. and the country. And that was a really big help. Uh, the other great help was that. Um, the uh, other brewers were a, an extremely uh, collaborative and collective uh, bunch. Yeah. We, and I, I've been to, I don't know, at least 60 breweries throughout the state and, and in the U.S. And uh, walked into a lot of places where basically the brewer will say, hey, you know, I'll ask questions and he'll, Tell me anything. Hey, where do you get your supplies? How long does this, what's the temperature range on this yeast? Anything from A to Z. And they answer all my questions. Where, uh, that, this is, 
a, a tremendous difference that we have in the brewing industry. And thanks to like the Brewers Guild, uh, where it's not uh, as secretive as say if you're in big business in the auto industry and there's no divulging of secrets. Well, yeah, and around there these are parts, no, you see those cars wrapped on the highway. Yeah, like, yeah. we're not even going to show that, you the yeah, curve of our yeah. new model. But there are no secrets in beer. We all have microscopes, and we can all taste. Yeah. And uh, I haven't met a brewer yet that wouldn't answer all my questions about anything. Well, and that's got to be, I mean, besides the nature of the community and the, and, and the collaborative uh, sharing of that information, mm -hmm. It's got to be night and day. I mean, imagine your early years as like a solo venture into the jungle with a machete, and yeah. you, you don't have anybody to compare notes with because nobody's nobody's walked we into that. We can't scout anybody else. There was nobody to yeah. scout. Yeah, and and uh, so I guess that's kind of where I was headed. Is like now that you're back in, I mean, I'd love to hear both about your decision to to open Ipsy Ale House and what your path looked like, but also. What does it look like for you, and what does it mean to see uh, a community of breweries and, and a beer scene that is together? Uh, you already started to hit on it, but I guess just how important is that, and what should brewers that haven't walked, haven't seen your past, what do they need to know about what's so valuable what they have now? Oh, I guess if I had any advice, it would be to apprentice yourself, if possible, to a, a good brewery and do some work and learn the ropes yeah start from ground zero yeah and uh and learn what we do because it's like any occupation as an apprentice or as a, uh when you're starting out uh if you have good training then you'll know yeah you know what to do uh, so what brought you what brought you back in um actually my son was, I think, about 15 at the time uh, when we were living in uh, uh, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area. And he said, um, gee, Dad, you got to teach me how to brew beer. And I said, yeah, Charlie, you're right. I, I, and so I uh, started uh, brewing beer again. I got with Mike O'Brien when he had the, the shop over on the Grain Towers in Ypsilanti there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, got set up and started brewing, and I did, oh goodness, at least 600, probably 700 uh, guiles, batches of beer, checking out every material I could find. I mean, some of the names of my old ales would be, you know, but when, you know, an Amarillo ale or whatever, just, uh, checking out the materials and ingredients and it's like cooking it's a taste and getting um, and now we've got um, we've got the advantage of oh uh, taking taking recipes from three or four different sources uh, one my ideal in starting the ipsy ale house was to have something like america's test kitchen for brewing, you know, Julia Child would be out there, and Jacques Pepin there, and she would in, in, invite a different guest who was a specialist in this or that or the other. And so that's what we do at the Ale House. We have a, a brewer showcase series where we've had prize winning home brewers, uh, uh, Jim Satin's uh, Scottish uh, 80 yeah. export. Uh, he's won a lot of prizes with that. We're, uh, We've collaborated with two batches, and we're going to be entering the Pro-Am competition early next year. Awesome. Uh, with that, and Jeff Renner with his, uh, what we have here is the streetcar number 10, which is uh, basically a recipe almost, well, they say good authors borrow and the best ones steal. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, a, a recipe pretty much taken from the archives of uh, 1910, six row malt and 20% corn. And a lager yeast uh, with some Mount Hood and um, cluster hops, which nice. were the early varieties on that. But we try to replicate uh, what people have done. So we have two historic beers on tap right now. One's the our Ipsituckee, which is a Kentucky Common Ale, a category that was just, uh, I think, uh, introduced a couple of years ago. And that one has 35% corn, 9% rye, and the rest six row. And a touch of black just to darken it up, you'd hardly, it doesn't taste dark. 
Yeah. But, uh, uh, so what's your son make of all this? He helps me on out uh, yeah. Yeah, with, with things when he can, uh, and uh, especially with festivals, because yeah. we got all these things. So, hey, Dad, can you teach me to brew? And the next thing you know, there's Ipsy Ale House happening. Yeah, well, uh, it, uh, yeah, I, again, I, um, what I did was uh, I was brewing a couple of times a week, and I decided, hey, I'm going to retire from tile setting. I can't take any more time on my knees. Yeah, and uh, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And I already have a really active career as a professional musician. I've got 85, maybe 90 paid gigs a year. Uh, and that helps me to get by, Kathy and me. Uh, so I decide, well, what I want to do is make music, brew beer, and be a grandpa. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's... There could be worse ways to, to live. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I had parties in my backyard where I would have 10 different beers and I'd have some slips for people to fill on out and um, uh, three different parties of about, I don't know, 50, 60 people apiece all giving their opinions. And I, uh, because tasters are so valued, I need tasters. Everybody has different buds and what. Kai tastes, or you, Fred, or I taste is going to be, I want to know what people are, um, what they're going to drink, first of all, for a commercial side. Uh, it turns out, in fact, my cousin Paula gave me the idea for our bestseller, a, a Blue Racer, which is all Michigan malt uh, from Pilot Malt House, no. uh, and um, uh, Michigan hops, Michigan blueberries, uh, nice. and... Uh, that is uh, our, our best-selling beer to date, and, uh, but that defies category. That is, it's a blueberry, honey, wheat beer. Yeah. When, and you, you'll never win a prize uh, for BJC. Uh, you win a more important prize, the you know, customer order over the bar. See, and there are two ways to brew beer. Uh, I mean, ph philosophically speaking, sure, I can. My cousin Paula said, hey, you need a beer with no bitterness, some fruitiness, nice and bright, good summertime beer. Uh, and so I developed that recipe yeah. because of that. And I thought, hey, let's use all Michigan yeah. uh, ingredients I love it. Uh, for that. And so then it's taken off. Uh, other beers, they, uh, my fellow uh, brewer, Tim Woolworth, is, is wonderful. And he is, is very expert. Uh, and so we knock heads on recipes or yeah. put together something, bring in a few uh, very different recipes and say, well, how can we do it here and uh, put it on out? So uh, oh, like our, our Tridge, which is our New England IPA, I, it's been selling like hotcakes. It's selling three times as much as any other beer. I know it's the, the New England IPA. Yeah. craze right now. It's the time. Uh huh. But so, uh, I think we've really hit that one on the nail. Awesome. So the idea is to pick a beer style and nail it. Like uh, take your prototypes, your er types, uh, and uh, and try to uh, brew it exactly as close as you can to those international standard beers. Yeah. It's like. It's kind of like music. Uh, um, if I'm going to cover a tune, do something that's, which I do all the time, something that somebody else has written, you either do it in the same style as the original and try to even better that, or, uh, or you take a completely different course and make it your own. Yeah. And so with brewing, you can... And if you mix either up, then like, you know, you're trying to do it your own, it becomes mm -hmm. too like the original, or if you're trying to cover it, and you're taking yeah. too many liberties, like that's where it falls apart. Right. That's, like know you what don't you, want know to what be you in want to do. In between uh, no man's no man's land yeah. ground, yeah. you want to uh, either have something that is completely distinctive, yeah. or master a style that's been there for all of them for quite some time. So wrapping up, what does it mean to you, or what is it as a fan of beer? How, whatever your perspective uh, is. I feel like there's a massive difference in terms of how the consumers support and champion beer now and how 
um, both in the industry, there's a different community. What does it mean to you to see uh, the change in community support and embracing beer from when you started? Oh, that it's a whole different world. In fact, we have events that, uh, I mean, not just the beer festivals, but we will be at the hands-on museum and, and have beers there. Or we'll be out at the farmhouse on, uh, uh, for different social activities for uh, $150 a ticket uh, uh, auction type of things. And uh, I, I'm meeting different people at every event. And we have at the Ale House, we have a lot of events come on, on through there. And a great, I have to say, the best live music in Ypsilanti. Uh, and to be able to, um, to realize that so many different people are drawn to just a curious about beer. Uh, yeah. And, um, and uh, in love beer... I, I try to, you know, I'm a, I'm a proselytizer. I say, hey, you know, beer is, beer is great, and uh, we want to introduce whatever we can to people. But you can't expect everybody to be the same uh, in their tastes, and so we'll try to cater as men, to as many tastes as we can, but with our own distinctive uh, imprint, yeah. I guess, for that. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a wonderful new world with beer, and I'm, uh, the longer I do it, the more ignorant I realize I am and the more there is to know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing, and, yeah. and thank, welcome back. Hey, Thanks thank for you. coming back into the, into the world of beer. Well, and, I, um, I think, you know, it's important people, young breweries, kind of understand what they have, that uh, we have we have a little different terrain these days than, than the pioneers, and I think it's, yeah. we don't necessarily want to go back or anything, but it's important to recognize what we have and and be, I don't know, be respectful and grateful and and, uh, and work on paving the paths for the next brewers behind us. Yes, we've got, um, I'm, I'm always looking at new things with uh, our Brewer Showcase series, like we have a Baltic Porter coming up for our third anniversary that'll be introduced on New Year's Day. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just uh, exploration. That's, that's what it's all about. And keep it on top of stuff. And every morning it's dairy farming and brewing are very similar. You go in and, uh, you know, hey, check the gravities every morning, check the temperatures and, and write down on the board what has to be done. Yeah. Uh, and uh, try and get as much done as I can between yeah. all the balls that I'm juggling and hats that I wear. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, man. Okay. Fred. Appreciate you taking yeah. time with us. Hey, thanks. Thanks for listening and sharing while supporting Michigan breweries and craft beer everywhere. The Michigan Brewers Guild was formed in 1997 with its first summer beer festival taking place in July of 1998. It's now five annual festivals are dedicated exclusively to Michigan beer brewed by more than 270 member breweries. The Michigan Brewers Guild exists to promote and protect the passionate Michigan beer industry in every way possible. To learn more, visit us at mibeer.com or say hello on one of our social media pages as we love hearing from you. From coast to coast, from far and near, let's drink Michigan beer. Michigan beer.